Thank you. Привет. Окей. Let's get started. Hello, this is a six-man working group. Just checking. I see familiar faces, but just in case, if you're in the wrong room. So we have two hours today. We have Bob remote, me here, and Uli very, very remote, so he couldn't even uh, join us. So note well. Please take a few seconds to read it if you, it's, if it's the first time you see it, or maybe if it, even if you see it before. It's like airlines, right? They always ask you to check the safety card, even if you're a frequent flyer. So, housekeeping. I was going to say, please wear masks, but everyone doing it anyway, so great. So, uh, please, if you're joining the queue, being in the room, please still use on-site tool because it would make my life much, much easier in terms of queue management and state your name at the microphone. David, who is taking minutes, will greatly appreciate that. And try to leave the queue when done. I personally keep forgetting that, but still. And remote participants, please keep your video and audio off until you start speaking. And then pl please use headset. Uh, so. And we also, if I can just add one thing, the chat seems to not be working, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as yeah, as Eric confirmed, it looks like individual messages work in the Mitako chat, but you cannot send messages to the group chat. Thanks, Bob. So here is a link to the agenda, which has all other useful links there, like to the slides, meeting materials, chat, and so on. Uh, so, agenda, busy one today. So we have approximately 65 minutes for working group documents. We have four drafts. Then we are going to spend another 45 minutes on individual documents. And we also have some time permitting with no time allocated. But I don't know, maybe we can done with all working group business so quickly so we can have some backup presentations yeah we seriously we got like about hour and a half more uh, requests than we can accommodate so so what's happened since we met last time we published an rfc on om in segment routing uh minimum pass mtu hope by hope option is an rfc editor skill Uh, we have yeah about one tricky document, and I'll uh, have another slide just for that about uh, alternate marking method. And there is a document which makes me feel guilty because I'm still working on the write-up. It's a six eight seventy four bis, so it's hopefully will be out for AD review later this week. And yeah, and as, as I said, we have uh, five working group documents. Four of them will be presented today. And one which is actually dangerously close to get expired, but I have not heard from authors yet. So the last of the chair slides. If you didn't pay attention to the mailing list, we had a interesting case when a document was adopted by the working group went through the working group last call and the ETF last call and was reviewed by ASG, but then quite late an APR disclosure was made. 
by one of the authors. And some requests were made, some comments were made about shall we consider it as a significant change to the document or at least something which working group needs to be aware of and decide if we still have consensus on proceeding with the document. So Altmark document was returned to the working group in the beginning of July. And the chairs believe that there is still consensus. Few comments were made, but it looks like there is no violent disagreement on proceeding with the document. So just today after some delay, yeah, I updated the thread. So I think we're good to proceed with that one. But to the all authors, please, if you have an IPR disclosure, it's re we'll really appreciate if it's done before the document is out of the working group. So I think that all of the chair slides, any like last minute comments to the agenda or nothing? Great. So I guess our first presentation today is Shuresh with the segment identifiers. Uh, I am going to share. Thank you, Jen. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's my really my only slide, really, um, but uh, I'll try to keep this very short. So this draft has been adopted like at the last ITF meeting and confirmed on the list after. And uh, there were a bunch of comments. So some of them just editorial. There's also some substantive comments. And they've all been uh, addressed in the 01 draft. So one key thing that came up was like a slight wording confusion in the IANA consideration section. So I had used the word global unicast, right? And people uh, kind of. Uh, some of the like uh, RIRs were like a bit confused that this is going into territory that the RIRs like kind of like allocate from. So kind of reverted the whole thing to say this is not coming from the RIR allocatable space, but it, instead it comes from the IETF resource space, right? Like so that's like one major thing. And thanks Jen, George Michelson, and Ted who kind of iterated on this so I can come up with the like right change there. It's a very small change, but it's very important because it clarifies where the space comes out of. And then we can define the properties of the space. And another thing is like from Darren, because I was talking about stuff changing on the fly, right, on, on, in transit. And uh, one key uh, thing was like it only changes at what could be a segment endpoint. So it doesn't change uh, willy nilly at any transit point. So I think that's something, it has a little bit of loose wording on my part and Darren pointed that out, so that's fixed as well. And the last thing is like either you can think of it as one point or two points, but it came from Brian, right? Like, so uh, this whole thing started like thanks to Eric and Joel. It started with like a request coming from Spring to Six Man, right? Saying, hey, write up like this thing. And so we've done that. And as a result of writing this stuff up, there's some actions that need to be performed in Spring at some future point. So we need to kind of close the loop on this, tell Spring that, hey, you asked us to do this. Uh, we've done it. And by the way, there's also other stuff for you to do, right, as a result of this. So that's something we probably need to craft an official message, like Jen, Bob, and Ola when he comes back, to get that message out to Spring, to kind of close the loop on this. Um, that's pretty much what's in there. So there's like no pending comments on this. So if you have any comments, like these three, for you to bring them up here or on the mailing list after, and I'll be like, very, very quick to kind of make the changes that is required. And let's go forward with it. So next slide, Jen. Yeah, so um, if like, you know, something um, is going to hold, unless something holds it up, like it'll be, I think the document is ready for working group last call. So I would officially request the chairs to uh, go for like working group last call on this, pending some hold down timer after the meeting. And also to um, write up something towards the spring working group. I know Joel is here and Jim is here as well. So like, but to write something up officially towards spring to say like, hey, we've done this, please look at it and they can forward the mail to the group and go from there. So, thank you. Yeah, any comments, questions? Silence, sounds like consensus. Oh, Silence. Eric. <laughs> The 
case of the battery dead mic. It was just off. Yeah. Uh, Eric Klein, so I guess I was going to try to channel Andrew, who's not here, and ask about whether or not the, uh, what people think about the slash 16 being a must not in the, in the DFC. Uh, okay, so if you look at the draft today, right? So the idea is like, so one of the actions that's for spring, so if, if you can go back to the previous slide, right, is to do the um, operational guidelines for the 16 as well, right? Like that, like spring needs to develop. So the idea would be uh, some operators who are deploying this will write that up and I'm perfectly fine with that, right? But that's, I, I think um, that, that would be a fine thing to write somewhere, right? Does that belong in this document? I don't know, right? Like that's, um, I think it's open to discussion. So if you want to put that in here, that's fine. Um, if it's going to go into an operational guideline document, that's fine too, right? Because the goal is for somebody to be able to filter it, right? Like so, um, and if you need like a stronger recommendation somewhere, that's fine. Um, like, yeah, so if Andrews like puts that up, I think we can certainly work on where we need to put it in. So maybe we just put that in the communication with Spring. Okay, cool, yeah. thanks. Okay, so thank you, Suresh. I think we'll issue the last call after this meeting. So sometime probably early next week, maybe this week, yeah. And yeah, we'll take care Not of Not this week. week. Like I know you're like stressed, so next week is good. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Bob. Okay, thanks. So. Okay, and the next presentation is Hope by Hope. Uh, processing procedures. Gore, I'm I going to share the slides or you want me to present? Hi. Um I can ask. There we go. That works. Hi, so um, this talk is traditionally done by Bob and I as we move between a square on the ground in the ITF. Both of us are remote this time, so we'll do our best to be brief, but we'd like to tell you about the updates we've done to the Hot by Hot Options Processing Procedures. Bob will chip in as he needs to. So, um, the previous version was working group 00, and we were working our way through a large number of adoption co questions, comments, and other feedback. And we made a number of updates that are present in the 01 draft. We added text to section one to make the focus clear. Uh, we're setting a minimum bound in this document for what we hope to see actually deployed in equipment what we hope to see the end systems being able to use across an IPv6 path. And this doesn't necessarily control anything about what you might do more than the minimum. We added text to section four. We said that some options will be supported internet wide and others might not be in limited domains. We added some references and clarified the H200 comments, fixed a typo, and then importantly changed the should not from a must not. And if you really cared about issue 21, you will realize that that is what people were asking for when we did the working group adoption. So I think that that is the summary of what we changed. Is that okay, Bob? Uh, yes. So I guess the other thing we should say is we have an issue tracker. It's the six man tracker. And we're trying to recall issues for this draft in that issue tracker. There were 21 issues when we started this from the adoption call, which is a very healthy group of issues to address. There are currently nine open issues. So I'll talk through those. The nine open issues actually relate to fewer than nine points. 
and the, this is our summary. The, the first one is what status will this internet draft have when it's published as an RFC? I, it probably was difficult to judge that at the beginning. Now it's maturing. You might want to try and help us figure this out. Should it be a BCP? Should it do requirements? Or simply be informational? Might be good as a BCP, perhaps. I don't know. And um, please tell us because we really would like to know what is best. Um, issues 9 and 15 relate to router alert or the router alert option, which was mentioned a number of times. It is a hot by hop option. And we're expecting this to be tackled by another internet draft in six months. So hopefully we can clear this issue by saying another draft will talk about this. Now the most exciting thing of all, what do we call it when a router processes a hop by hop option as part of its forwarding? It could be processed maybe in software, it could be maybe processed in an ASIC, it could maybe be processed in some offload or a machine engine. We previously called this slow path and fast path. People hated that because they said it referred to a router design rather than a, a way of processing. So we now talk about processing extension headers, particularly hop by hop headers, at full processing speed. We think that resolves the issue of talking about slow path and fast path. But to believe we solved it, you'd have to read the text and tell us that you like what we've written. Um, I'll talk briefly about number eight, which is lack of graceful handling of malformed extension headers. We think this is a security issue. We'd like to add some text and security considerations for this. If you care about malformed extension headers, please help us write that text. We think it's more or less the same as any other malformed header. Um, if you write bad router code, then your routers will either crash or behave badly. If you write good router code and protect the code, then you don't have a problem. Doesn't seem like something new for hot by hop options. Um, RSC 9098 talks about processing the payloads of IPv6 packets as you forward them. And again, if you're interested in this topic and think there is good text on that, please tell us. It doesn't particularly relate to hot by hop options. And it may perhaps be something to mention in security considerations, since this is commonly done by firewalls and other middle boxes. Uh, we don't have any ASIC experience. Well, I don't. I don't think Bob has either. So if you know about what ASICs are actually deployed in new equipment and want to talk to us, please do. We would love to hear you. We will be influenced by people who tell us that they are deploying things at scale, that do things, that need things to happen. So talk to us, please, if you're thinking about having extension header support for hot by hot options. We'd love to hear from you. And the last one was a comment I don't know what to do with, so we will leave that on the screen as, option, as issue number two. So that was my quick tour. And we really do want people to read the document. So the first thing we'd like you to look at is whether we have eliminated the definition of fast path and slow path and replaced it by something useful talking about full forwarding rate. Please read the draft, we think this issue is solved. We'd love to hear people's feedback about whether we've got good language here or suggestions of something better. I talked about this. I think it's a security consideration. If you agree, please tell me. If you disagree, please tell us both. <laughs> we talked about this. We don't see this as a particular issue. If you think it is, please talk to us. So what are the next steps? Well, if we've actually resolved the issues we've talked about, then our document is either ready to decide its standard status and publish as a viral working group last call, or it's time for people to tell us that there are more issues with it. Either way, we're looking for reviews of our document to revise our ID. And I think that's our slide deck. Any comments or questions? Fernanda? 
Ah, uh, yeah. Hi, Gori. Oh, um, I haven't looked at the document for the last something, uh, you know, months. But if you need a, a review, I can volunteer to do a, you know, another review of, of the document. Well, if you anyone offers to review, that would be great. And Fernando, you asked some of the questions I've just put up. So yes, please give us feedback on whether we're making progress and suggest more text for the pieces we need to solve. Wonderful. Yeah, I think um, I would add particularly, you know, if you, you see an issue in this document, please suggest text to how to resolve it. That's very helpful to us. Okay, so yeah, please read the draft. I think we should have some discussion on the list and yeah, based on that then decide after closing those issues, yeah, we can and discuss the last call. So any more last minute comments, questions? Ah, we're doing well today. Hello. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Thank you, Gore. Okay, and the next presentation is Fernanda. Improvement to stateless auto configuration. Okay. Can you show the slide from there? Uh, okay, yeah, if you want me to, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll share the slides, just a second. Okay, so hi all, this is uh, Fernando Gont. I'll be doing the presentation on the document improving the robustness of uh, stateless address auto configuration to flash renumbering events. Uh, next slide, please. So super, you know, short uh, background. Essentially, this is a topic that we have been working on for, you know, a couple of years now. Um, there are a few documents uh, that some of these work was has been carried out in, you know, in the B6 group. So we have RFC 8978, uh, which is essentially the problem statement document. Um, then we also produce RFC 1996. Uh, which is recommendations for customer edge uh, routers. And finally, uh, this is, you know, the last remaining item, this document that I'll be presenting today, which is protocol improvements to actually, you know, improve the, the handling of uh, flash renumbering events. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, uh, a few comments about the progress on, on this ID. So essentially what we have been doing is, uh, you know, incorporate the contents of the uh, individual submission. Uh, first comment is that I recently, last month or so, pulled the six month working group about two specific items. Um, we have received some comments on those, but if for some reason you have missed them, please, you know, feel free. I will send an email to the mailing list to, you know, to highlight the, the threads. So if you have comments on those two topics, uh, please do send your comments um so that we can address them uh, you know when we produce the, the the resultant text for the document and there was only a single um uh, you know topic or issue to to address which was the uh, that of incorporating the algorithm to uh with heuristics to uh, deprecate stale information uh what we have done uh is to produce a, a i would say a simpler and more robust uh, algorithm uh, from what we had in the individual submission. And, you know, the goal of this presentation is essentially to uh, to describe the, you know, the algorithm, uh, you know, from a conceptual level. And, you know, afterwards, I'll be sending the draft text to the mailing list for, you know, the specific review of, of the text. Okay. Next slide, please. So what's the idea? And actually, this slide, this slide makes it look like more complex than it actually is. So what's the basic idea uh, of this algorithm, the, the, you know, the improved algor algorithm that we have produced? So it's, the idea is super simple. Um, if uh, your host receives an array that uh, contains missing information, so it's lacking information that was received beforehand, what we want to do is to uh, poll the uh, corresponding router with a unicast router solicitation to double check if the information is there or not okay 
then based on the result of that, we can decide whether, you know, yeah, the information was there and we can, you know, keep the information or actually not, the information has become stale, so we should, you know, get rid of it. Um, this slide just makes the, you know, the process or, or the algorithm more, uh, it just addresses details. So we start at the you know, beginning when an array is received, okay? We are considering arrays that are missing information that have been previously received from this router, okay? So if we have one of those cases, then we will wait for some time. This would be like a couple of seconds because it could be in theory, doesn't happen in practice, but could happen in theory that the router is splitting the um, Slack information into multiple packets. So we will wait for some time here. Then. If that information is not hasn't been received, what we do is just wait a random, small random period of time. That's just to avoid a lot of host on the same network to pull the router at the same time. That's the, the random wait that we have there. And then what we do is essentially just pull the local router with a unicast router solicitation. What we do, what we do by default in the algorithm is just pull once, but it's you know up to the implementation. You could you know pull pull multiple times, send an arrays. You know if you don't get what you want, you pull again and so on. If when we get to the arrays arrays R S proof timeout here, you know by the end of the yellow graphic, we haven't received the missing information from the router. So that means that the information has become stale, okay? And what we do is essentially uh, remove that you know, stale data. So in the next slides, what I have is essentially like uh, uh, you know the same graphic, but an analysis of your know, typical scenarios. So next slide, please. So this is the most usual case. You know, nothing bad is going on. So we just receive an array with all the same information that we had received before, okay? everything's okay there's nothing to do there's no missing information nothing to trigger there all information is fresh next slide then we have the case of fresh data but with the corner case theoretical corner case where the router splits the slack information into multiple packets again i've never seen that and i don't know anyone that has seen this in practice but in theory the specs allow it so what we have is we receive an array, the first one, okay, that doesn't contain all the information that we have previously received from this router, okay? So we wait for some, we enter this algorithm and the algorithm says, okay, before you, you know, pull the router, before trying to pull the, the router, just wait for some time because the information might arrive in a separate array. So we wait for some time and we indeed receive the array with the missing data, okay? So again, all the information is fresh. There's nothing to do about it. We are okay. That's why we have the, you know, the green stuff in there. Next slide, please. We have another, you know, this is again, corner case. We are just trying to be super robust. We have again, the corner case where we have a router that is uh, spreading the Slack information into multiple arrays and there's also packet loss, okay? So some of those arrays with partial information might be lost. So we start here uh, with uh, an array that contains partial information. And when we receive that array, we say, okay, well, partial information, we need to double check if the rest of the information is there or not. We wait for some time, we wait for the missing data, but one of the other arrays just got lost, okay? So what we do is we do a random wait. This is just a few seconds, random value of a few seconds. And then we decide to prove the router with a, a unicast router solicitation. This is when we enter the you know, yellow stuff in here. So we send the proof to the router, the router responds, and we do receive the missing information. So all the information has been refreshed, nothing else to do, we are okay. We enter the green stuff again. And last slide. Next slide, sorry. Well, next slide is exactly the same. So we receive an array with partial information. We wait some time to receive the missing data. We don't receive it. So we say, okay, time to pull the router to see if the information is there. We do pull the router, but we never receive that missing information. 
So after polling the router, in our case, we poll the router just once, a single RS, but it's you know it's it's uh, configurable. You could you know uh, uh, request that the host polls the router more than once. Once we get the response from the uh, router, from the advertising router, if the information is not there, we say, okay, we hadn't received the information before, we pull the router, the router is still not sending that information, we consider the information has become stale, so we, we disassociate that information with the router, okay? Uh, next slide. So that's the algorithm. Uh, it uh, it's uh, it's uh, simpler. It's simpler and improve over the version that we had for at least two reasons. Two reasons. First one is that in the previous algorithm we were uh, you know we had to modify uh, you know the timers, for example, of the options, which that made the you know the algorithm more complex. That's one thing. And the second thing is that the principle here is super simple. If there's information that is missing, what we do, we send a, we pull the router with a unicast router solicitation and wait what comes back. If the information doesn't come back, well, it's not there. And so the principle is, is, is simple and obviously more robust than the previous algorithm. So we will send the you know the text for the you know for the you know the the, the, the algorithm to the mailing list for review. But I'm I'm wondering if there are any you know comments or, or questions about it. Tommaso. Yep. Uh, Tommaso Pecorello, University of Florence. Uh, just a quick question: uh, What if uh, the uh, information keep being sent and being lost. Uh, I mean, suppose that super corner case uh, of a router that sends the uh, array with uh, two or more packets uh, and uh, it keeps sending the information upon uh, a router solicitation, Unicast, and it keeps uh, being lost sometimes. I think that uh, we need a number of retries time after which it is uh, given up uh altogether yeah so the algorithm does consider you know that of the number of proofs to be configurable so i would say that you know slack anyway assumes that you know uh if off the top of my head like you know three retransmissions and you know if uh, after you retransmit three times things don't work well slack will break anyway uh but so if we wanted to fail on the safe side, we could, you know, instead of defaulting to a single proof, we could default. We could default to three. That's that's in the document already. It's just, you know, ch uh, changing the default value from one, which is what we have right now, to three. But it's a valid point. Tim Winters, QA Cafe. My question would be: Do you want to send a the multicast array out at the very end before you get rid of the info to make sure there's nobody out there that might have the no router out there that might answer you? Uh, no, because you do this on a per router basis. So thinking from a multi-router, multi-prefix uh, point of view, what you do is you don't remove the information altogether, but you disassociate that information with the, that specific advertising router. If there's any other system that you know is advertising the same information, it's okay. So you will keep that other part. It's just disassociating the information with that particular router. The only case in which you end up completely removing the information if there was a single router advertising the information. Yeah, I guess the only case there, I guess, would be failover. Okay. Uh, actually, yeah, I'm putting no heads. Just, Janinkova, just curious. Yes, yeah, so I also was going to ask, was Timothy asked about uh, sending maybe all routers RS, not unicast, because it might be a corner case when your link local address of one of the routers changed, but the information at PIO is advertised by the router is still the same. So in this case, I guess you don't, you would not see it yet. For example, maybe you have not received an array from the router but you would not ask as a router at all, right? 
but my expect my, at least my expectation would be that uh you know when and that is you know according to 4861 that if you know the the uh, router for example change the address and it becomes an you know an advert uh, advertising router it will multicast the information and actually a couple of times from you know as soon as it you know joins the network so you should have received that information too okay but um, it's something that we could do anyway i i don't mind you know doing that it's it's I don't mind. Okay, and the second question, I'm just curious. So, uh, remind me when you say you remove the associate outdated information, you mean make the address invalid or deprecated? So, in this case, what we do is, uh, first of all, we uh, we don't say we eliminate the information. So what we say is we don't consider that uh, this information has been advertised by that particular router. Now, assuming that a single router was advertising the information to you know to go back to your case, what we do is we would end up removing the addresses, okay? Because we are proving the router, okay? So it's not that just we missed. We are proving the router. The router is responding, and the router is not advertising the prefix anymore. Okay, so any existing sessions which are happening between devices on the same link using that address will be disconnected, right? If that is the only router advertising the prefix, yes. Like any, I mean, I was curious if there's any strong reason to do that, because if you have like session between two devices on the same link, you're basically breaking it while the session could have survived. Uh, yes, but I would say that that is a side effect when you are using uh, essentially uh, provider dependent prefixes for local connections. So uh, I would say that's that's the case. Uh, and the reason for which we uh, it's a valid point to you know to reevaluate uh, the reason for which we are uh, we, we uh, suggest to remove the addresses is that the router is responding. So it's not that it's dead it's responding and not sending the prefix anymore so otherwise you would be dragging information that has become stale it's not that the you know the, there's a transient problem with the router that is not responding it's responding and not advertising the prefix cool it's a very last question so in not responding means there is no pio or pio with preferred lifetime or valid lifetime zero preferred lifetime zero more interesting corner case it means the router is responding so it's it is sending an array but it's not including the PIO that has that had previously been advertised. Okay, so which is the case. Matter. So like preferred lifetime zero in that PIO will be still counted as advertised. Just curious. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Bob, you were in the queue, no? Oh, you disappeared. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to ask that um, based on. I think we asked Fernando that um, he said you've never seen a case of a router splitting information over two RAs. So I, based on that, I wonder if it's necessary or how useful it is to have the case, you know, to include that in this document. So it is included. So we haven't seen that case in practice, but still the algorithm accommodates that case. So the algorithm is ro robust in that case. So we don't react right away when you receive an array with partial information, but actually wait for other possible arrays containing the missing information to arrive. Okay, thank you. Okay. No. Okay. I'd send the 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 draft text for the for the algorithm on on the list. That you know, the, in these slides we cover the you know the the, the let's say the, the the concept of the algorithm. I will send the text so that you know folks can look into more detail and provide feedback. Eric. Eric Klein. Yeah. So I assume this is like section four point five that says TBD. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I ask whether your proposed text is largely narrative or will it be framed in the in in the will it be framed as a state machine particularly the state machine that needs to be implemented to keep track of this yeah yeah i can i have yeah. the text already i can send it right away uh, i was just going to express a personal preference i don't know about anybody else but a personal preference for uh like a 
describing a state machine operation. Okay. I think it'll be, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, good. Thank you, Fernanda. Looking forward to seeing updated version. Thank you. And the next presentation is covering VTP information and extension headers. Okay, Jidong, uh, would you, I go into share the slides or you like me to present? Uh, you want me to share my desktop or from Up the to system? You, like you, you can request sharing slides or I can do that for you and you'll just ask me to move forward. Okay, to the next slide. maybe you can help to share it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is Jidong from Huawei. And I'm going to give an update about this uh, draft on carrying the VTN information in the IPv6 extension header uh, on behalf of these co authors. Okay, next slide, please. So, here are some background and the current status of this draft. Uh, basically, this document uh, introduced a new a uh, hub by hub option to carry the VTN information in the IPv6 packet. Uh, it is used by the transit nodes on the path to steer the packets to the set of network resources allocated to the VTN. Um, uh, we received comments uh, during and after the adoption call, and this shows there there is interest to make this option generic and more flexible. So, in the last IT meeting, the authors presented uh, some considerations about the, the extensibility of this VTN option, both in the semantics and also the format. So, in this uh, 01 version, uh, it reflects the update to the format of the VTN option, uh, while well, the generalization of the semantics may need some further discussion in the working group. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, here we show the updated uh, waiting option format. Basically, it uh, is, consists of the option type, option data length, and the flags field, the reserve, reserve field, and the waiting resource ID field. Uh, in the option type field, uh, the first two bits are set to zero so that it is uh, ignored when it is not recognized in the uh, packet forwarding, and it is not uh, should not be changed in the in the packet forwarding. Um, the option data length is set to eight. Um, it reflects the length of the data fields. Here we introduce a flags field, and uh, one flag is defined in this version. It's called a strict match, which means that uh, when a packet uh, has its uh, as flag set, it must uh, match with uh, the BTN. Uh, I, a resource ID which is configured on, on the outgoing interface for the packet forwarding. Otherwise, it packet should be dropped. And if the S flag is uh, set to zero, it means that when it, there's no matching of the VTN resource ID on the outgoing interface, the packet will be forwarded using the default set of resource on the interface. Uh, the reserve field is to uh, leave for the future extensions to this option, and the VTN resource ID is uh, for uh, octet identifier of the set of resources allocated to OVTN. So with this format, uh, we keep the OVTN option with a fixed length and also leave rooms for the future extensions. Okay, next page, please. Okay, here are some other updates in the 01 version. Uh, first, we clarify that the VTN option can be used for network slicing and could also be used for other application scenarios. And in the context of network slicing, the VTN and NRP, uh, the network resource partition, are similar concepts. Uh, it also clarifies that the relationship with the 5G network slice identifier, which is SNSSAI, uh, basically in the 5G network slice scenarios, there may be mapping relationship between the SNSSAI and the VTN. 
uh, we also update the forwarding behaviors, which takes the S flag, uh, the value of the S flag into consideration. There are also some editorial changes in this uh, version. Okay, next page, please. Okay, here are the next steps. Uh, we would like to collect the further feedback from the working group. And if there's interest, we could continue to have the further discussion about the semantics generalization. Then we will update the document accordingly based on the comments and feedbacks. Thanks. Eric Vain Cisco, no specific head. Again, I, I keep repeating myself on this specific draft, but having a fixed length option for just a single use case is a kind of a waste of the code space. I would prefer very much to get a variable length color thing that could be applied to many, many use cases. Yes, uh, thanks for your uh, comments. Uh, we noted your uh, suggestion about the variable lens. Well, uh, we also see that in the hop by hop processing draft, it uh, 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 recommends or uh, it uh, uh, the rule in that draft is that uh, we should use a fixed lens options for hop by hop uh, header. So maybe we need to consider whether we need to align with the rules in that document. But I agree, we need to make it uh, extensible. That's why we introduce some new fields and uh, maybe and not limited it to the natural slicing uh, use case. Yeah, that is uh, for sure. Thank you, Joel. Joel Halpern with Ericsson. Um, I think that your intention in the wording was to meet some requirements that you and I have discussed and the working group has discussed in the past, but the wording left me a little confused. You sometimes talk about this field as a VTN ID. You sometimes talk about it as a VTN resource ID. I hope it's the resource ID, i.e. it's an aggregate that can be, that represents a resource allocation to meet some set of traffic which may be a collection of VTNs or whatever, at which point the other thing is then I think that means the same thing as the NRP, the network resource partition that's discussed in T's, and we should make clear the relationship. And that's the really important part. We should make it clear <laughs> what we're representing, whatever it is, please. Yeah, uh, thanks for your comment, Joel. Yeah, I agree that uh, we have been discussed about the, the semantics of this uh, ID, and I we have made it, made it clear that it is the resource ID, VTN resource ID, or we may call it the uh, uh, NRP ID if we, for in the context of slicing. Um, but uh, you may also know that uh, there's the suggestion about the gener generalization of this uh, the semantics of this option or the ID, so may, we may uh, we, we are open to some further comments about the generalization and maybe it is not reflected in this current version. We are still using the meeting resource ID here, uh, but uh, we may consider whether there's other suggestion to make it uh, more generic in this semantics. Thanks. Okay, I do not see anyone else in the queue, so thank you, Jim. Yeah, I thank guess you. we shall expect an updated draft based on the comments you received today on the list, right? Okay, now we are moving to the individual drafts on the agenda, slightly ahead of time, great, so we might have more time for discussion for them. So I'm going to share the slides for I see PV6 extensions for I am discovery. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, okay, your floor is yours. Okay. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's Xiaomi from ZT speaking. This presentation is on ICMP v6, echo request reply for enabled in situ OEM capabilities. Uh, this is the second time I presented. Uh, next slide, please. This is the recap of this draft. Uh, this draft defines ICMP v6 extensions to achieve IOM capabilities discovery in IPv6 networks. Uh, this draft uh, is a companion document of a uh, draft IETF IPPM IOM comp stage. Uh, this draft uh, defines two new ICMPv6 messages uh, called IOM echo request and IOM echo reply. For ICMPv6 IOM echo reply, uh, six IOM capabilities objects are defined. Uh, they are IOM pre-allocated tracing capabilities object, uh, IOM incremental tracing capabilities object, IOM proof of transit capabilities object, IOM edge to edge capabilities object, IOM DEX capabilities object, and IOM end of domain object. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, shows the status of the uh, draft IETF IPPM IOM comp state. Uh, this IPPM document defines a general method of IOM capabilities discovery, allowing the IOM encapsulating node to discover the, the enabled IOM capabilities of each IOM transit and uh, decapsulating node along the transport path of IOM data packet. Uh, this draft has passed the working group last call in IPPM working group and is currently with uh, transport AD. The general method uh, defined in that uh, IPPM document can be applied in uh, IPv6 MPOS, SFC, and uh, BIA environments. Next slide, please. Uh, the 00, 00 version of this draft uh, was presented at ITF 112. Uh, some good discussions happened there. Here we just a few updates since then. Uh, firstly, one more example uh, where two namespace IDs are deployed was added. Uh, secondly, the encodings of IOM echo replies examples were updated to align with the IPPM document. Thirdly, uh, some editorial changes were made and the needs were fixed. Uh, note that uh, one more need in figure six will be fixed in the next revision of this chart. Next slide, please. Uh, next step, uh, the authors ask the six men working group to consider adoption of this chart. Thank you. Okay, comments, questions, suggestions? This room is very quiet today. In the in the chat, Eric um, asked whether node information queries could be used for this. Uh, uh, Eric Ving, Cisco, no head, and thank you both for point, printing the point. I'm a little bit annoyed by using an echo request reply for such in information. There is an experimental though, information node query, and I would kind of prefer and find it more logical to define a new ICMP code or type, I never know which one to be used, for this rather than echo. So, uh... They asked me to compare the ICMPv6 and the 
load information queries. I, I, is this your intention? I would prefer to use something else than an echo request reply to convey this kind of information. Uh, but in RPM document, uh, we have defined that uh, we need to use echo request reply to convey the IOM capabilities. Okay, anyway, let's continue over email, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think it's because your audio might not be working very well. Yeah, so let's yeah. take it to the but next. I yeah, but I think, yeah, I, I think I tend to agree with Eric. I, th I think it's definitely worth looking at because that's that's a structure that could be used for other kinds of queries, including this one. Okay, but we can discuss it here, uh, by email further. Good. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you, so, uh so, Eric, I'll delete you from the queue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fine. I just wanted to make sure you don't have more questions. Okay, so next one. Okay, I'll share the next set of slides for you, Xel. Uh, it is. Um, okay. Okay, thank you, Jen. Uh, hello everyone, it's Tommy again. Uh, this presentation is on the 6th upper layer checkpoint. Uh, this is a 00, zero version individual draft. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the problem statement of this draft. In SRV6, uh, when the last seat is a compressed one, the upper layer checks some computation rule defined in RFC 8200 doesn't apply anymore. Here we provide two examples when RFC uh, 8200 doesn't apply. The first example is the next uh, C seed flavor of compressed seed. Multiple seeds may be carried in the RPv6 destination address at the same time. Second example is the replaced C seed flavor of compressed seed. The last element of the routing header may be not a 128 bit address, but a 16 bit or 32 bit compressed seed. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide demonstrates the proposed solution in this draft. Well, firstly, it keeps uh, RFC uh, 8200 as is. Uh, secondly, it inserts a 128-bit address of the final destination into the last seat uh, using a new SH flag to indicate the insertion. Thirdly, uh, the pseudocode on processing the new defined SHC flag is copied here. Uh, please review the pseudocode after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, slide. During the discussions on and off the mailing list, uh, two other proposed solutions were raised. The first one is to standardize that the last seed must be uncompressed. And then uh, keep RFC 8200 as is. The second one is to require that at the originating node, when the last seed is compressed, uh, decompress it and put the resulting IPv6 destination address into the pseudo header for upper layer checksum computation. And then update RFC 8200 accordingly. Next slide. Uh, next steps for this job to the authors ask for more uh, review and comments and expect to converge on one uh, solution. That's all. Thank you. Well, Darren is in the queue. 
Yeah, Darren Duke, Cisco Systems. Uh, the SR source knows the destination, um, whether it's compressed or uncompressed, doesn't matter. Uh, by the time the packet reaches the destination node, the destination address is in the destination address field and is used for upper, header, upper layer header checksum calculation. I don't think there's, just, uh, there's any need for this draft. It works as is. Uh, you know, uh, this chapter, in this chapter, we have the program statement. Uh, that, that's mainly because in RFC 8200, uh, it's assumed that the last seat uh, is uh, 128 uh, bit IPv6 address. So at the originating node, we need to have that kind of last seed. Otherwise, the checksum calcula calculation is not applied, uh, it's not aligned with RC8200. Uh, yeah, and no, I'll say I think that problem statement is wrong. Darren, maybe if you can put your comments on the list. Uh, I will, thanks. Yeah, so it, we can continue discussion on the list on this. Yes, thank you, Terry. Okay. Uh, no more comments or questions. So we then move to the next draft. Paula, are you in the room? Ah, great. We switch to somebody in presence. Right, okay. Yeah. So good afternoon, Paolo Volpato, I'm with Huawei, and I'm presenting on behalf of uh, my co-author, Edward, which I guess is connected remotely. So just to give you the background for uh, this draft, we developed some time in analysis on uh, neighbor discovery protocols uh, and the role of uh, ND to keep with uh, uh, to handle, say, the um, uh, prefix robustness uh, cases. Um, we decided then to, let's say, narrow down the scope of that old draft and move to this one, which is basically uh, the role of neighbor discovery in uh, multi-homing, uh, multi-prefix networks. Um, next slide, please. Well, there is no need to discuss what a, a multi-home and multi-prefix network is. Uh, there is a, one example here in the picture. You see basically um, something that sometimes is used for uh, small offices, home offices. I would say this is specifically useful for uh, say small or medium enterprises. You have, for example, two routers, two CEs connected to two different providers. The reason for that is to, let's say, uh, provide resilience or let's say support uh, uh, load balancing or whatever other applications that are useful for an enterprise. The topology, the architecture of the internal network may be quite complex. So this is to say the main reason. Uh, there is a lot of literature that uh, has already described these cases. So how to let's say deal with the different connectivity um, cases or the lack of connectivity because of faults. Uh, you see some example there, site topology discussed in uh, 7157, uh, which is the, I would say, the original um, RFC to discuss uh, multi-homing without a net. Uh, there is the 8678, uh, 78, which is the full analysis on the requirements and solutions for uh, the usage of uh, uh, multi-homing, multi-prefix networks, especially for enterprises. Um, let's say that to grant connectivity there, we have to uh, solve a few issues, I would say. So we have to solve a few problems. Um, you see, they are listed here. Um, choose the right source address, choose the right next hope. And then there is also a third problem, which is not addressed by our draft, but that is, let's say, how to provide connectivity to guide connectivity to steer the packets across a, uh, let's say, complex uh, topology using source address, single source routing. Um, again, if you look at the available literature, the cases for that are almost solved. 
I would say. There are problems uh, still to be addressed, but let's say most of the uh, mechanisms have been uh, um, addressed. Uh, you see, for example, 8028 and again 8678. Now, for the open cases, so we have focused our analysis on the role of neighbor discovery. So, uh, once again, uh, 4861, 4862, and the default address selection, because the mechanism to decide the source address and the next uh, uh, hope is defined by 6724. So we have identified two scenarios, and I'm sorry, maybe the terms we have used are not probably uh, so widely adopted, but let's say, first scenario is probably the most common. Uh, we have called it uh, uh, equal prefixes. So we have two routers. We can decide which one to use depending on the specific application. So basically, if I want to, to reach a destination on uh, internet, I can use, for example, router A or router B, depending on the address you plan or, let's say, on the requirements of my application. Um, basically, the mechanisms are defined in 7624, rule four, rule, um, sorry, rule five or the optional 5.5. .5. Uh, you can also apply the conditional uh, POS for deciding um, how to, let's say, select the source address and, uh, let's say, uh, decide, okay, this is the next stop I want to, let's say, to use for connecting to the destination. Okay, this is it. But there is another scenario, and probably we focused on the second one, which is the one that we called, we named, non-equal prefixes. Uh, why that? For example, because there is a special case a special requirement to steer the traffic, for example, to a dedicated site. So, typical example, wallet garden. Um, other case, well, uh, we want to steer the, the, the packet to reach a, a certain destination through a certain gateway because of a specific requirement. For example, the, the packet loss or the latency provided by one of the upstream uh, providers. How to deal with that in the multi-homing, multi-prefix multi case? Well, based on our analysis, the only solution available today is defined here. So we have to apply uh, routing information options and uh, uh, let's say some, something that could uh, change the uh, default policy table, for example, through DHCP v6, which is defined by RFC 7078. To our knowledge, this is not so widely adopted. So that could create some cases. So how to solve this issue? And we can move to the next slide, please, Jen. Okay. Um, we have identified one potential uh, solution, but there is uh, probably one caveat. So one, one thing that we uh, should pay attention to, and I'm pretty sure that could also raise some concern or some criticism. So for example, the idea is that in the source address, in the, the, tape, in the, in the process to decide which is the source address to be used by a host and uh, which is the next hope we need to, let's say, to select to reach a certain destination, well, we have to define that source address selection comes first. Um, I think this, uh, could be also taken for granted, but actually this is not the case. So if you read across the available uh, literature, this is not always the case. There are um, points in, in different, uh, scattered across the different RFCs where you see that next op selection comes before source address selection. Clearly, we are open, as I said, to comments and criticism to this point. But if we uh, let's say take this uh, uh, this path so we decide that source address comes first and then we select the next loop then we have uh, the possibility to open let's say many more uh, um, cases or uh, mechanisms to solve uh, the connectivity aspect when we are in presence of uh, 
specific cases as the walled garden or as we said before the idea of choosing a specific path because of uh, let's say application requirements next slide please then we have also to take into consideration what happens when we have failures so when we lose connectivity for example in that case let's say to uh, to give a solution which is applicable to the selection of uh, uh, the right source address so to drive the traffic through let's say the network to reach uh, the wall and garden and to cope with the loss of connectivity we are proposing our draft some modifications that we believe are not so, uh, let's say, impactful on the uh, existing RFCs that you see listed here. So basically the idea is that clearly we have to, um, to agree upon the fact that source address is selected first, then we move to the selection of the next op. This is point number one. Um, then we can apply something which has been already described, as I said, in different RLCs that make sense in dealing with this aspect connected to multi home and multi projects. So clearly, select a next hope um, that has already announced the source, let's say, the prefix um, uh, to which my source address belongs to. Um, then dealing with the deprecation of the prefix information options according to the specific case so if we lose for example the source prefix accordingly we have to inform the internal network that something is happening um, touch also some other let's say um, rfcs according to the mechanism that we are going to define basically the idea is that for multi-homing, multi-prefix in IPv4, there is a solution, which is typically based on private addressing and net. And we'd like to also find a solution to the same issue when IPv6 is used. So that we can move to the next slide, please. And they said, so we are open to any comments, um, feedback, even criticism. We are very happy to let's say, to listen to you. Um, by the way, the analysis is open. So this is version zero. So anyone interested could join and be also co-author with us. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I see David. Uh, David Lampotter. So um, considering that link local addresses are essentially free and abundant, um, I don't see any need to change the source address selection order to select the source address before the next stop because anything that can be achieved by doing that can also be achieved by simply adding a new link local address on the router and choosing that as a next stop and then choosing the source address to match that. So that seems to be a much simpler approach. Okay, so as I said, uh, I don't expect that everybody agrees, of course. Uh, um, let's discuss it. Uh, if you are interested, we can have an exchange and see why we are proposing that. Sorry, I, I'm keeping it simple, but just for the sake of saving time for other questions. Uh, Eric Klein, uh, no hats. I mean, I, I absolutely agree. If you have 8801 and you generate per, per PBD link local addresses to announce them, you don't have any problems here. You do have a, a, a implement, an implementation of 80, 8801 is, you know, I don't know want to say complex or non-trivial, but there's a lot to consider there. And some of those considerations are some of the things that I saw on the slides. Uh, so if you wanted to write a document that was maybe more in the style of all of the ink that was spilt in the MIF working group, that might be helpful for people who want to do 8801. But I think 8801 plus uh, per PBD link mm -hmm. local addresses and, and like this okay. is, so it's it's done. Okay. Fernanda. Couple of comments. Um, you know, one meta comment is that you know I see that um, this document and you know also the 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 previous um, document that you had author on on prefixes uh, has a lot of overlap with. Uh, 
you know, work that this very same working group is carrying out with a working group document. So um, the work on, you know, the, uh, let's say, um, prefixes that become stale uh, is work that has been going on for, you know, about two years. A lot of it happened in B6 ops. There's a remaining bit in Sixpan, which is, you know, the document that I presented before. So what I would expect is that the associated work with, you know, stale prefixes is, you know, done in that context. Otherwise, it's like redoing stuff that the working group is already doing in an individual submission. Uh, so that's that's one of my comments. Uh, the other comment that I have, you know, I, I went through the document yesterday and I see that this document is, um, I don't know if it's mixing things that are like, you know, a topic on their own or that is trying to do too much into the same document. For example, I read parts where there are discussion about the properties of IPv6 addresses. Like, you know, what are ULAs useful for? That's a topic on its own, okay? Uh, more than, you know, a couple of, of paragraphs as, as part of, of this document. There are other areas where, you know, the document, uh, you know, tries to analyze scenarios for which there are operational workarounds. That's probably more for a document for B B6 ops than for Sixman, I would expect. Uh, same for, you know, analyzing gaps where there are scenarios that you want to support, but there's, you know, nothing there to support them. Probably what I would expect there is a B, you know, if anything, a B6 ops, you know, document that analyzes the cases that you want to, you know, to address, analyze the gaps, and then do the standards uh, work. And then, um, you know, that might require, a, a, you know, a reread on my side, but, you know, I, I got the impression that uh, uh, more than uh, trying to, you know, tackle the, you know, the problem in, um, you know, in a, in a generic way, there's a lot of analysis of, um, you know, super specific scenarios. Uh, again, I might need to reread the document, but I got the impression that uh, there's a lot of energy being put on specific, you know, cases. Uh, as opposed to, you know, trying to see the broader, you know, picture and, and figure what's what's missing here. Okay, thank you. But let's say that, as I said, this over, is version over. zero zero. So, could I try to answer this? Because uh, for overlap, uh, um, I don't agree. Because for overlap, we have really deleted everything which was really overlap in the previous draft. Yeah, previous draft was was a big overlap. You're right. Yeah, but this one we have deleted everything which overlap. They believe this one is just about multi-home, multi-prefix, which is specific topic for that reason. Overlap, I would not agree. For mixing things, maybe yes. Maybe we need to think more about uh, your comment that it's mixing things. It's very complex. Yeah, probably. Probably you're right. Thanks for your comment we'll think about it and especially good your comment about ULA that maybe ULA discussion could be deleted from here we'll think about it maybe maybe yeah, maybe really ULA discussion could be deleted from this therefore thanks for feedback we'll think we'll think about it thank you Edward. Okay. And for Eric, uh, for Eric, uh, for Eric, uh, uh, question: Could I try to, uh, to answer? Because uh, I still believe that RFC eighty eight zero one uh, is not enough. Uh, because if we will choose not properly initially next hop, then it would be too late uh, to apply eighty eight zero one. But uh, we, we will take it to offline. I will prepare a long, more or less long message to the alias, and I will try to to explain why eighty eight zero one uh, is useful only after the source address is chosen. Uh, Janinkova, no head. Uh, I'd like I'd like to second comment Eric made about PVD because actually ITL has been trying to solve this whole problem for a while. I remember we have a lot of discussions. I remember ITF 2016 in Berlin when all these discussions started, right? And even then, it was like uh, PVD seemed to be like a proper way of doing this. So maybe if you think for some reason. MPVD doesn't solve your problem. The document needs to have better problem statement explaining why exactly MPVD does not do because I honestly, I read it and I'm still confused why you cannot use MPVD and how basically switching the order of changing address selection would help you in this particular case, right? Uh, so yeah. 
PVD, PVD is good enough after the proper source address is chosen. After this, PVD is good enough, uh, no, no problem. It's compatible to PVD, but PVD itself is not enough. Uh, initially, we should properly uh, choose source address. Okay, we, we will try to explain it in different way and, and maybe longer. And, okay, we'll think how to explain it properly, why PVD is not enough. Yeah, so uh, Edward, I, yeah, so just maybe just have a section in the beginning saying this is what's going to happen with NPVD, right? And this is why it's bad. And this is a problem it's causing and how we need a new solution which do what we'd like to achieve, right? Because it looks like I'm not the only one confused. So probably, yeah, we need to clarify. And, um, and as we said already on previous previous slide, PVD is compatible. If, if we will properly choose source address first, then PVD is compatible. Previous previous slide. Uh, among um, a list of algorith algorithms which is possible to use, previous slide, uh, PVD is, is, is applicable. It's not a problem to use PVD, but uh, initially we should, should choose properly source address. Okay, we will try to explain it better. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll okay, CJ Light, Edward, the floor is yours. Okay, this uh, particular slide deck, deck is a small one. Um, go next slide, please. Uh, of course, we know, uh, we discussed many times already on the alias that uh, there is a security problem that any anybody could Im impersonate any other node on, on the link because anybody could claim that a particular MAC IP relationship is, is his his mark uh, and uh, in such a way could poison the cache for other not especially for router is dangerous uh, indeed rust uh, model has a general discussion how to do this uh, in my particular draft i have referenced here we, i have a more detailed really detailed discussion how to really poison the cache for other not but okay it doesn't matter because of course everybody understands that if there is no encryption then it's possible to impersonate other not okay it's a problem initially it was um, believed that APSEC will help help but uh, then it has been understood okay APSEC is uh, some for some reasons is a challenge uh, not suitable okay fine then uh, send and CGA has been prepared and it's it's a good strong encryption no problem but okay nobody accept it again uh, and uh, I have an opinion that APSEC and CGA send has not been accepted because it's a key management challenge it's um, public key infrastructure management key management is a big challenge which is of course if you have it it's it's, it's excellent but uh, if you don't have it then it's not applicable and uh, especially one comment about cga initial cga that initial cga was not as a separate solution it was not possible to use it as a separate solution it was a part of send it was dependent on send and uh, it just one reminder that initially cga and send together uh, they they connect public key to ip address Okay, okay, interface identifier, but it's IP address. Uh, it was connection between public key. It was not, it was not connection like in uh, ND protocol between MAC address and IP address. Uh, what is possible to do? It's possible to, to use the same algorithm with the same mechanism which has been used in CGA, but uh, it's possible to connect MAC to IP. Uh, the primary function of ND protocol MAC IP connection. And if uh, we will connect MAC to IP by this simple CGA, uh, even a little bit simplified, because in this particular document, CGA is a little bit simpli simplified for that reason, it's called CGA Lite. But it's in principle, it's it's the same CGA, it's the same algorithm which is used in Bitcoin, in blockchain, in, in CGA, it's, it's again the same. And then uh, the security of IP would be equal to security of MAC address and MAC address security is good for some particular technology it's good for dot one uh, dot one x it's it's good for, for wi-fi because we have encryption and if mac is protected by by some layer 2 technology then ip would be the same protected because ip would be connected uh, by effectively in very secure way connected to mac uh, to mac address next slide please how to do it uh, is exactly the same like it was for 
very similar, very similar, not exactly the same, but very similar, like it was for CGA. Initially, we prepare some block of information with uh, some some information like network name or, or time or nonce or whatever, uh, which is needed primarily to uh, for temporal addresses, for uh, different stable addresses, for different uh, interfaces. It's, uh, uh, it's to, 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 uh, to be compatible to all other uh, things which we have for, for address. And then uh, we do hash, uh, connect, uh, prefix and mark do hash again. And after double of hash, uh, we are trying to uh, find uh, the hash which will will have some number of lead, leading zeros. Uh, the draft itself has a discussion how many leading zeros is possible and how ma many leading zeros is more or less good security. And how and, uh, it's, it's a discussion is m more accurate in the draft uh, uh, how to properly choose number of leading zeros. But uh, if it's not enough, then we do mining. We, we change non so change something in the initial information and loop again and uh, do it again and again and it's um, mining but uh, if you would like to s s simple security uh, not very strong security that mining could be very fast it's uh, even possible for IT devices it's, it's it's explained in the draft that it's possible even for such low compute computing power less, like IT devices if you would like something strong which would be really protected okay you could do mining longer or you could use uh, stronger machine even not, not the node itself but you could use some some offline com computation and then you will get some number of leading zeros uh, the trailing uh, bits could be used for interface identifier uh, you could ask question Eric uh, yeah Eric Ring Cisco and in this case now at again we are linking again the interface ID to the MAC address are we back to AU64 problem and lack of privacy no, 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 no. Because look, on this particular picture, it's good that you asked right now. Because look, on the upper side of the slide, you see uh, the block which has inside collision count, net name, time, nonce, other information. If you will put here, and definitely you will put here enough information, then uh, you will get different, of course, uh, um, um, interface identifier for your different uh, logical interface, for your difficult physical interface. No, no, no. We, we will not break anything. I I have analyzed carefully temporal addresses, stable addresses which are different uh, for different logical interfaces or different network names are still possible. It's not a problem because uh, it's uh, initially you will you you will choose different information for generation of such addresses. No problem. Okay. Thank you, Edouard. Uh, another question now. Maybe you are aware that there is a Madinas working group. Then I put my AD hat on again, which is about randomized and changing MAC address. So typically, we will change the MAC address, and as far as I know, Windows 10 is tend to change the MAC address quite often during a day, even. Mm, okay, but it would be like temporary addresses. If you will choose a uh, low level of security, small number of leading zeros, then uh, generation of new uh, new IP address, uh, new interface identifier would be easy and would be fast. But yeah, it would be additional burden uh, uh, because it's additional mining. But uh, it depends uh, how difficult um, you will choose security level, how, how difficult, how many number of leading zeros you will choose. If you will choose a small number of leading zeros, okay, it's not a problem. Okay, but it's worth mentioning in the draft, most probably. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good comment. It's a good comment. Yeah, thank you. Go next slide, please. Uh, for legal host, it would be extremely easy to um, uh, check that some particular MAC to IP relationship is legal because uh, it's just one hash. Just one hash uh, based on public information and any other host will check uh, that, okay, this combination uh, is, is legal. Go next. If bad guy will try to break this, the bad guy, what, what bad guy needs? The bad guy needs uh, the same interface identifier, but for different MAC address. It means he, uh, he will change something in the source initial information. Then what he need to do, he need to do mining. But in his case, mining would be much, much more difficult because in addition to some number of leading zeros, 
he will need additionally 60 trailing particular bits. 60 bits at the end should be exactly a uh, particular uh, interface identifier. It means that two powered by 60 more hashes. It's uh, extremely strong additional protection. It's again analyzed in the draft uh, how strong it is and how it's comparable to, to Bitcoin, for example, how fast whole Bitcoin network could crash this, for example, how much time will be needed. Okay, go next. Uh, uh, there is a little bit information which could be should be distributed public information uh one is uh, hash type and for hash type uh, i'm trying to use already defined option uh, 39 uh, not to invent something new of course it's possible to invent something new if you believe it's 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 useful but uh, my initial assumption not to invent something new uh, and additionally, uh, I need digest of ID information, which uh, I am proposing to as a new option, as a new one additional option. Go next. I have analyzed more or less all other um, uh, extensions for ND, which we have, like uh, optimistic uh, ND, like uh, grant, like uh, ND proxy, like uh, all type of addresses, and looks like it's compatible to everything except a few restrictions which is put on this particular slide. The one restriction, because everybody is equal in this ecosystem, uh, nobody could uh, be restricted who is router, who is not router, everybody is equal. And for that reason, uh, uh, it does not preclude anybody to claim that he is router. Therefore, era guard or era guard plus is, is still needed. It's, it's, not, it's not a protection against um, router fake. It's okay. One a comment. Another comment, of course, is not protection against DOS or DDoS because anybody could generate many uh, uh, legal legal IP, ad IP and addresses and then uh, spam everybody. Okay, it's DDoS is not protected, of course. And there is one real case which is really uh, could happen if a particular legal host is disconnected his MAC and his IP is not available, then uh, anybody else could try to use his MAC and his IP address. Uh, and if um, the low level infrastructure, level two infrastructure will accept his MAC address without authentication or with maybe bre breach, uh, some, some problem with uh, of, of authentication exists, then uh, because he will claim the MAC and MAC is uh, not available, he will claim IP address because he IP address is connected, just connected to MAC and if anybody. It's low probability because uh, server probably is always available, but for client, uh, we don't so much care. That's it. Uh, okay, Fernando, yeah, question. Um, the goal of this proposal is to prevent IP address impersonation or or what yes, is specifically yes. yes yes because now the guy yeah. who uh, the, the, the pair the pair mark to IP address this pair could not be claimed by anybody else nobody else is capable to say okay this particular IP address is mine I have different mark mac to ip will be strict, strictly connected uh, by cryptography it's, it would, would not possible to break uh, this particular uh, connection but then you mentioned that for example this will obviously not you know uh, uh, so so what are the attacks that you have in mind because you're saying that you know this will not protect against you know uh, for example a node claiming road please go to slide two to slide two slide two yeah, two. On the slide two, on the left side, we have a discussion section 4.1 from ND Trust model. And uh, in my draft, I have more detailed discussion how to particular uh, poison the cache for any other node. And uh, this is against this. This is against po poisoning of the cache of other node because on the other node, we could claim uh, that uh, this particular IP address is uh, connected to different Mac and then would be middle in, a man in the middle attack. Yeah, so in general, you know, I, the idea of tying identifiers, um, you know, from different layers uh, together has generally proved to bring problems, you know, unless you really need that. So it's entangled things that they don't really need to be entangled. If you want to, you know, uh, in a way, you know, when we moved away from EUI 64, it had to do with that, like two identifiers from different layers tied together that they shouldn't. That aside, you know, if in the same way you'd need RA guard anyway, why would you uh, 
for example, Butter implementing this as opposed to using ND inspection, for example, part of first hop security? Um, ND uh, inspection, uh, like Savvy, for example, is good. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's supported just by a couple of switches. I mean, just one vendor, a couple of switches. It's, it has really low acceptance by the market. Yeah, but you need a guard anyway, because you know, in that case, I I could you know as an attacker spoof a router. So if you don't have a guard, I can attack you anyway. So no, no, no. A guard is very simple. Uh, it's uh, uh, it, it's not so complex. Like uh, uh, you'll do. Uh, of course, if you will do ND snooping, ND snooping, full ND snooping, like Sadi, uh, of course, uh, then you could trace who is co who is connected to which particular port, and uh, you could you could keep security. Uh, but array guard is much simple. Uh, I mean, uh, array guard, uh, you typically point one port and say, okay, on this one port, check that the ICMP does not have array, and that's it. Uh, it's it's very simple. Every switch supported, uh, but not every switch su support ND snooping, and for that reason, this particular ND trust model section 4.1 is still not protected okay the big principal difference here is only one initially cga and send we are connecting public key to uh, ip address here is connection mark to ip address and for that reason there is no need for public key infrastructure there is no need for key management and for that reason acceptance uh, probability by the by the market is much higher that's it from my side okay uh actually uh, i put myself in the queue uh, John Linkova now has, I'm not actually exactly clear why you're saying it's only for disconnected node an attack could happen. What would prevent an attacker to claim MAC address and IPv6 address while node is still connected? Because if um, uh, it's partially true, but okay, if, if particular layer two infrastructure has two nodes which claim the same MAC address, would be flapping uh, and uh, in this flapping of course you could catch some some packets in, in this particular flapping but uh, it's a, a layer two problem if you have in some particular layer two domain domain uh, it, it's it's not normal situation anyway for layer two if two mac addresses connected to one layer two infrastructure for that reason uh, it's uh, it's problem anyway uh, so basically you're saying you would be, you would rely on monitoring and alerting in this case to detect an attack but it's not actually prevented right um you could say this way yeah but uh, may, maybe not just this way because um uh, additionally it's flapping i mean interface uh, mac address and interface would be up and down up and down because uh, mac address would be duplicated duplicated mac address will not permit uh, to, uh, the host to operate anyway the, the host probably uh, will call support and ask for support because he, he could not work well, I guess in many cases, scenario with stolen addresses also can be detected by monitoring and complaints. Yeah, but I guess uh, we are talking about preventing the attack instead of like reacting to it. So actually, my second question is, if your hosts are kind of in untrusted domain and you don't trust them, would not it be better just perform layer two isolation and solve all this problem forever? But if your hosts are sitting in the same broadcast domain, they're kind of in the same trust zone from security perspective. So I'm not sure how big the problem is actually in uh, like real life. Mm, in majority of cases in, re in real life, Wi-Fi, for example, or Ethernet switching infrastructure, data center, uh, enterprise, whatever, we typically don't have isolation on, at layer two. Typically, uh, one VLAN, for example, everybody uh, could connect to everybody. Um, I, I'm not sure how many, probably very small number of uh, cases we have in the world that people here really imp implement something like private VLAN, for example, or filtering on, on Wi-Fi. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, it's possible. It's possible to restrict that only um, uh, Wi-Fi uh, station could uh, go to only to uplink. It's not possible to uh, to send packet from uh, one Wi-Fi station to another Wi-Fi station. It's possible. It's possible to do filtering, but typically it is not done. Typically, uh, especially in data center, but in enterprise networks, uh, typically it's possible inside one VLAN everybody connect everybody. Okay, uh, thank you. So, any other comments from the room or from remote participants? Okay, so I guess we shall continue that discussion on the list. And thank you, Edward. Thank you. And the next, okay, the next presentation is expert of Segment routing information in IPFIX. Okay, let me get the slides. Perfect. Good afternoon, everybody. Thomas Graf, Swisscom, on behalf of the authors. Uh, this is about enabling insight in SFR6 forwarding plane by adding segment routing dimensions in IPFIX. Thomas, may I ask you to be close to the mic or just sure. hold it because I suspect people remote might. When you turn around, you, people might Perfect. not hear you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Next, Next slide, time. please. So, uh, speaking as a network operator and looking back from a migration between MPLS and MPLS SR, uh, we, we know that data plane visibility is very important during migration. And uh, currently, it's missing in SRV6, and we're trying to address that in this uh, document. Uh, we want to see, as a network operator, uh, uh, how much traffic and if traffic is being forwarded or dropped towards uh, a segment identifier. We understood that currently SRV6 is already being deployed by network operators, and also the first uh, ones uh, started to do migrations from MPLS to SRV6. Uh, the main uh, data is coming from the uh, segment routing header, which is defined in section two of RFC 8754. Next slide, please. So the elements coming from the SRH header are, uh, for instance, the segments left field, the, the tag field and the flex field, while other informations, for instance, the SRH active segment IPv6 type is uh, basically describing from which routing protocol the active segment is uh, coming from. While the SRH segment locator length and the SRH segment endpoint behavior also are information uh, coming from the, the control plane, basically describing uh, the, uh, additionally the, 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 the segment routing, the SRV6 dimensions. Next slide, please. Uh, there are different ways how to expose the, the segment lists. Uh, one is by doing the decomposition on the, the network node with the SRH segment IPv6 basic list and the SRH segment uh, IPv6. While the other possibility is to maintain uh, the, the, uh, the SID list completely and expose it in one element in the SRH segment IPv6 list section while the last possibility is actually to expose the entire uh, SRH header in the SRH section IPv6. Depending uh, which uh, solution is being chosen, there are different implications, especially in terms of uh, scalability, which are described in the operational consideration section. Next slide, please. Uh, this draft was already being presented at ITF 113 to spring and OPS AWG. We received various feedbacks. Uh, we all addressed already all open issues and also double checked uh, the IANA consideration section with the IPFIX doctors. We added per request also uh, in the operational consideration section uh, a section how to decompose uh, the segment list. Uh, uh, when compressed SIT is, uh, is being used. And we added, therefore, the sec SRH segment locator length and the SRH segment endpoint behavior in the draft. We aligned the naming uh, from, of the IPFIX entities uh, from the RFC 1712, updated the SRH flex IPv6 registry, and uh, have now in the 
addendum section examples for uh, all the different data template, option templates, and data records. Next slide, please. So the next step is um, we have currently two major vendors which uh, validate the technical feasibility and working on uh, implementations. INSA University in Lyon is working on running open source code in VPP. Uh, we will be able to show that at ITF 115 hackathon. We as authors believe that the document should uh, progress quickly through ITF to avoid private enterprise code points being used in SRV6 deployments and therefore requested at ITF 113 at OPS AWG adoption. Looking forward for comments, feedback. <clears throat> Anyone? Oh, Eric, you like to say something? Okay. Uh, I guess I just wanted to ask to be clear, you're not proposing any changes to 8754? Correct, there are no changes. We are proposing changes to, action, to RFC 1711, which is IP fixed. Yeah. Okay, so I see no comments here, and I guess it's just for information, right? So no action requested from this group, except for, I guess, review comments would be appreciated if you're interested. Okay, exactly. thank you very much. Thomas. Okay, and topology identifiers in extension header. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I'm just, I'm starting sharing your slide. Okay. Uh, uh, this document is about carry topic to identify in IPv6 extension header. Uh, next page, please. Uh, MT and FlashEgo can generate multiplayer routing plans currently uh, to dis distinguish different routing plans. MT and FlashEgos are mainly identified using different IP addresses in that packet. We need to plan different IP addresses for each MT and FlashEgo, which increases the network development complexity. The IGP protocol needs to advise more IP addresses, which also brings scalability problems. The application of network slicing also increases the number of MT and FlashEgo in the network, which increases the impact on the network. Because an interface may belong to multiple MT or FlashEgo, this problem cannot be slowed, slowed by associate, associating separate interfaces uh, with different MT and flash egos. Uh, this document introduces, introduces a general approach to allow, to allow different MT or flash egos to share IP addresses, a new hop-by-hop -hop option of IPv6 extensions header is defined to carry the topology identifier, which is used to identify the following table instance create, created for MT of Flasego. Uh, next page, please. Uh, this is an example for topology identifier. In this scenario, links which different colors belong to different Flasegos. Uh, Green for FlashEgo 128, blue for FlashEgo 129, red for FlashEgo 130. All FlashEgos share the same node IP address. For each FlashEgo, each node calculates an SPF tree independently and generates an independent lib or fib. Uh, next page, please. Uh, this document introduced a new hop-by-hop -hop option 
which carries top topage identify each top uh, each topage identify is mapping to a folding table topage identify is in in, uh, in case in case on the head head node the mid node makes the folding table selection based on the for based on the topage uh, in capsule this look then look up the folding table and send the packets. Uh, next page, please. Uh, this is all. Uh, any comments are welcome. Thank you. Uh, Peter, you first in the queue, I guess. Peter Pschenak, Cisco. So, when we designed the FlexAlgo technology as such, one of the strong requirements was not to require any specific data in the packet. We tied the FlexAlgo with the forwarding construct in a packet, which is either a SRM PLS label or an IP address itself, which is the SRV6 case or IP Algo case. So, what you are trying to do here goes completely opposite what we are trying to do with the flex algo. And a bit of a history here, an MTR has been tried and failed miserably because of the need to classify the packet on every hop. This is exactly what you are doing. I'm not sure this is a good idea. Thank you. Eric Vane, Cisco, no specific ad. I simply repeat what I said for the previous draft for the VTN ID. I don't mind, and don't discuss the flex algo thing, right? Because I'm not an expert there. But having a way to mark or color the packet is interesting for sure, but make it generic, not one per protocol. Thank you. Hi, Suresh Krishnan. So just a question. So is this the host putting in the information for the routers to look up on what routing table? Uh, hello, Suresh. Can you can I take this uh, question? Yeah, the, the question was who's putting in this empty info? Who's like putting in the hop by hop option in there? Is it the host that is initiating the packet? Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Thanks so, for your question. In fact, this is the ingress router of this the uh, of this the uh, MPRs, uh, 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 of the tunnel. I mean, so the ingress router encapsulated the uh, topology information in the forwarding data plane, not the host. Okay, so I think like there's something that you probably need to do a little bit more, like the security stuff in here, the properties of this is like very scary that you determine like, you know, how the router looks it up. So probably you need to spend a little bit more time on the security properties of this um, before it goes forward, but I do, uh, if the uh, people like, you know, uh, Peter was here, uh, if this is something that's not signed off by the eventual consumer of this, we need to discuss that first. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Jen Bin, you are next in the queue. Okay. Uh, Jen Bin from Huawei, I would like to uh, add some of these the comments regarding the uh, Eric and uh, Peter's the uh, comments. Uh, the first one, I mean, so the Peter's the uh, opinion. I, in fact, this is explained in the uh, in the slides because according to the current uh, uh, design of the flex algo, it uh, need to uh, uh, need more uh, IP address for the different uh, uh, topology, so that it will consume more IP addresses. So here we introduce a new method can share this the IP address and also take the advantage of the IPv6 to encapsulate the topology ID to identify. So this is just the solutions concept. A second one regarding the Eric's concept, I, I uh, comment. I, I agree with this one. In fact, in the network, uh, in the TIS working group, we propose the uh, one draft uh, generalized uh, IETF network slicing. Uh, we are discussing about uh, if the 
uh, waiting resource ID is can be generalized to represent the topology or not. Yeah, we, we ask this the comment. Okay, that's all. Joel Halpern, Erickson, I'm, I'm sorry, but this doesn't add up. The fundamental problem you stated was, well, we need a different IP address for each topology the end node is participating in. From where I sit, that's a benefit, not a drawback. This is IPv6. We're not short of end node IDs. <laughs> Bob laughs. This is, it works. Whereas you want to introduce a new extension header that we have to take into account in forwarding at every hop. This is a very difficult problem solution to a non-problem. Please don't. Tomasa? Yeah, Tomasa Pecorello, University of Florence. I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I missed something, but if I remember correctly, an option either can, an extension here cannot be added by a router, can be modified by a router, but not added. I don't know, maybe I missed the RFC. Okay, to me, because you know, in the router, because the packet will encapsulate the tunnel header. When encapsulates the tunnel header, we can add this the information uh, with the uh, with the topology. Uh, add the topology information with the new tunnel header. I think that's uh, that's uh, different from the host process. I will try to read your RFC and see if I see any. Anything that I missed? Thank you. Okay. Uh, actually, I locked myself to the queue. No head, but I actually agree with Eric that we kind of see a lot of different drafts, provided which suggesting different kinds of identifications related to network slicing, APN, and so on. And I'm not an expert in the area, but I think it would be a good idea to consider yeah having one thing which can be reused instead of standardizing five million different options it's not like comment to you but i think people like maybe we either here or in some other working group need to consider yeah, how to solve this problem once and for all and i see eric is looking to the microphone uh yeah i was just gonna say i sent email to the responsibility for t's uh about uh the status of the network slices document there, it would be uh, in the hopes that we could eventually get a conversation um, about network resource partition identifiers and all these other sort of identifiers. It, it's not clear how many of these we actually need, and uh, but we haven't uh, we haven't closed on that conversation yet. But if uh, uh, six man chairs could always send a liaison statement to the T's chairs and ask about those kind of things. Cool. Thank you, Eric. Okay, we have four minutes. So I'm, uh, Jean -Bin, do you reckon you can give us overview of generalized channels in four minutes? Yeah, yes, uh, I'm okay. okay. Very quick. I'm sharing the slides then. Okay, so this is Jamin from Huawei. Uh, my presentation is a generalized IPv6 tunnel. Okay, next page. Okay, so here we uh, propose this the uh, challenge because we know now we have the many types of the IP tunnels, uh, such like the GRE tunnels, uh, VXLAN tunnels, and also have many variants of these IP tunnels. All these tunnels have this the format with uh, IP source address and IP destination address. So at the same time, we now we also have the many new features. Even this has been uh, proposed by Gene uh, in the previous comments. We know now we have this the network slicing, and we have this APN. We have this the alternate marking. We have the IOM. All these the new features we need the new encapsulation, and this the new encapsulation has been defined and being defined for the IPv6 encapsulation. So now we have this the challenge to how we 
define this the encapsulations for this IP tunnels. So this has the challenges. Okay, next page. Okay, so here I propose this challenge. So that's the first one. If we define this the new features encapsulations for all these IP tunnels, we have the huge standardization standardization work. And the second one is difficult to keep the consistency between the IPv4 and the IPv6 because it has been recommended the new work is to be done based on the IPv4, uh, IPv6. Uh, third one, I mean, so there's some of this is the function redundant because, for example, IP, if we use the IPv6 for the IPv6, uh, for this IP tunnel, so that's the IPv6 flow label can be used for ECMP, but uh, you know that uh, in history, the IP tunnels, some IP tunnels take use the IP UDP port number for the ECMP. So there's the uh, repeat, uh, repeated functionality in the same uh, this uh, tunnel header. Uh, so this uh, the last one. So that's uh, we can difficult to extend based on the existing format because some uh, IP tunnel has their own header. For example, VXLAN and GRE. But we also have some of these tunnels such as the IP in IP. There's no their own header. So that's uh, it's, uh, difficult to have uh, unified uh, this the extension if they to support uh, the new features. So we next page. Uh, sorry, we have just one minute. So can you just quickly yeah. summarize? Yeah, oh, yes. So here we just uh, we have proposed this generalized IPv6 tunnel header. So we think that for all these IP tunnels, we uh, you have the uh, generalized the IPv6 uh, uh, IPv6 uh, tunnel header. That means uh, the IPv6 header and all these the new features and all the uh, existing IP tunnels functionality can be encapsulated in the IPv6 extension header. So it means there's no need necessary to defend the new features for all these IP tunnels. That's the concept. Okay, that's all. Okay, thank you. I don't think we have any time for discussion, but I guess the draft is in the writing working group as well, right? So, okay. Thank you very much, everyone. See you in London. Please read the drafts. Please comment on them. Okay. Thanks. Yes, thank you all very much. Okay. Okay, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Bob. Thank, take care.